Hi, my name is Shimant Mishra and this is my video lab report for Intro Physics 2211 at Georgia Tech. This lab examines the motion of a falling object. I'll first introduce the system, its surroundings, and some key ideas and formulas relevant to the lab. I'll then analyze the motion of the box and discuss two computational models I use to predict its motion. This will be followed by a comparison of the graphs obtained from these three sources. And finally, I'll answer some essential questions about the lab. When an object is dropped from rest, the only forces acting on it are the force due to gravity, also known as weight, and the drag force. These forces act in opposite directions, but they do not cancel out. This results in a net unbalanced force, and Newton's second law states that an object's acceleration is equal to the net force acting on it divided by its mass. Since the net force is non-zero, the result is acceleration in the downward direction. The formulae relevant to this lab are shown below. The velocity update and position update formulas are applied iteratively in the models to predict the box's position and velocity as a function of time. The force due to gravity on an object is equal to the object's mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. The drag force acting on an object is proportional to the square of the instantaneous velocity of the object. The b in this equation is the proportionality constant. This diagram shows the forces acting on the falling box at different times. Initially, the magnitude of the drag force is less than that of the force due to gravity. This results in an unbalanced net force that I mentioned before. As seen in the diagram, the net force points downwards. In this case, the box has not yet reached its terminal velocity, which is the velocity at which the drag force and force due to gravity are equal and opposite. This is shown in the second diagram. Here, the force is balanced, and the resultant net force is zero. By Newton's first law, the object doesn't accelerate. It has reached and will now maintain its terminal velocity. Some key assumptions I've made in this lab are that the drag force is always proportional to the square of velocity and that the force due to gravity is always constant and equal to negative 9.81 meters per second squared. I use this video of the box along with tracker to plot its position as a function of time. I chose my axes such that up is positive y and down is negative y. So I obtained a downward sloping graph of position versus time as seen here. For the computational model, I used the starter code and wrote the equations I mentioned earlier in Python as seen here. Here's an excerpt of the code from my first computational model, the one without drag force. The box is initially at rest, so both the position and velocity vectors are set to 0, 0, 0. I filmed my video at 60 frames per second, so I set delta t to 1 over 60, such that each time increment is equal to 1 frame. And finally, since the drag force formula is not being applied in this model, I set the proportionality constant b to 0. So here we see where I've calculated the force due to gravity. Since I assume no drag, I've set the net force equal to the weight of the box. Now the computational model with the drag force has a few key differences, one being that the proportionality constant is not zero. I set it to 0 0.0027419, a value I calculated through trial and error until the model predicted a final position equal to that of the observed motion. Another key difference is that the net force now includes both the force due to gravity and the drag force. You can see where I've calculated the drag force and included it in the net force. Here's the graph incorporating the results of the observed motion and the two models. First, let's compare the observed motion to the computational model without drag. The computational model begins to deviate almost immediately from the observed motion of the box, over predicting the box's position in the negative direction for the entire time period. This can be explained in terms of the drag force, which is absent from this model. Since there is no force opposing the box's downward motion in this model, the box is predicted to travel further than it actually does in real life. Now let's compare the observed motion to the computational model with drag. In this model, I've chosen the proportionality constant such that the final positions predicted by these two models are equal. Once again, the model over predicts the box's position, except this time it does so in the middle time sectors. This can also be explained in terms of the drag force. What probably happened is that the drag force was larger than expected at the start, possibly since the box is so light, but then as the box rotated while falling, it became more aerodynamic and was less affected by the drag force, and thus ended at the same final position as the model predicted. To improve our model with drag further would require a better understanding of the drag force and possibly other equations that factor in more than just the velocity of the box. Additionally, using a spherical object instead of a box would reduce the chance that the drag force would vary as the object falls. Both these changes would make the model more accurate. So which of the models predicted a terminal velocity? Well, as discussed before, a terminal velocity is reached when the drag force is equal and opposite to the weight. Only the second model factored in the drag force, and hence this is the only one that predicted a terminal velocity. In fact, on the graph, the yellow line does begin to somewhat flatten out and become increasingly linear, suggesting that the object is approaching its terminal velocity. And what if the object was thrown downwards instead of dropped? Would this have an impact on its terminal velocity? 
Well, an object's terminal velocity depends solely on the velocity needed for the drag force to be equal and opposite to its weight. What velocity the object starts at is irrelevant, as it would simply approach the terminal velocity in the same way, albeit from a different initial velocity. An object's terminal velocity is generally specific to the object and is not dependent upon its initial velocity. Thank you for your time and have a nice day.